Welcome to the Seven Figure Network Podcast, folks. My name is Melford Bibbins. Today, I'm joined by John Melton, and I'm so excited because John is at the top of a company that is just growing so fast right now that he is going to share with us some tips about what's working today. And you know, the one factor of this show that I take so, so seriously is we don't care what worked 10 years ago, 20 years ago, unless it still works today. So that's exactly what we're gonna talk about with John today is what's working now, uh, what got them their amazing trip to Santorini, because I love Santorini, so I gotta talk about Santorini. You know, working with his wife, all the cool stuff John has going on. So first and foremost, John, thanks so much for being on today, but I really appreciate it. Absolutely, Mel, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. I, I gotta know, go ahead. No, I'm excited. That's it. Oh, it's great, man. It's, it's so funny. You and I, <laughs> we were joking about this beforehand. You and I talk so fast and have so much to deliver to each other. I, I got a feeling this is going to be one of these interviews. It's like this. So hey, I, I want to know what actually got you in the industry in the first place. I mean, let's kick off the story from day one. Yeah, it was uh, 2001. I was uh, broke, busted, and disgusted. I was 20 years old, had no background in business, probably no business being in business, but uh, I was just very open-minded because I was not a fan. My daughter was just like running through the room. So it's like, I, I hated school. Thank God she's straight A student. Uh, for me, I lived for the weekend. I liked having fun. I liked to party. I got into all the wrong things, if you know what I mean. But I think the reason I got in so much trouble when I was younger, because I just had uh, no real vision for my future, no direction, no motivation. Uh, I, I didn't think the whole like go to school, get a degree, get a job, work for somebody else forever. Like that just never appealed to me. So you know what? I thought there was something wrong with me. Ugh. I thought there must be some, I'm like a loser. Like Ugh. what's wrong with me? And then of course, years later, when like social media becomes a thing, you start following people like Gary Vaynerchuk and yeah. you know, you start hearing all these like success stories, uh, getting into just network marketing period. Mm -hmm. You start to realize that like, that's actually fairly common mm -hmm. that, you know, the independent entrepreneurial, you know, a personality, they don't want to, you know, just work for someone else and have this right. like very boring, monotonous career. And by the way, there's people out there that love what they do. My mother was a school teacher. She loved it. I could never imagine going to school, paying all that money, learning about things I don't care about just to go get a job doing something I don't love. Like, mm -hmm. I think that's why for me, I had really a very open mind to network marketing. And I was just like, dude, what is like genius? I can get rich. It doesn't matter if I'm from Yale or jail, which I was in jail for like 10 <laughs> days. Um, you know, I've been arrested. I've been, I, I've been, I had been in a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. So uh, when I saw the presentation, they talked about residual income and they would teach me how to do it. Like they gave me hook, line and sinker. I was like, take my money. Let's go. But back then, of course, it was very old school offline. Yeah. You know, uh, we were doing, you know, meetings and, and cold calls and doing all this stuff that used to work, like you mentioned. And uh, at some point, after years and years and years of working offline and then eventually getting into doing PBRs every night, private business receptions in people's homes mm -hmm. uh, and never being home, mm. we started to realize that either A, network marketing was no longer for us, mm -hmm. or B, we were going to find a way to do it without having to leave our home. We used to have this joke. It's the only home business where you're never home. And then it's like, <laughs> is that really funny when you have kids? Yeah. You know, it's 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 funny at first. And later on, you're like, dude, I'm like sacrificing like what's most important to me. Yeah. And we talk about like why we're doing it and freedom and family and all these things. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have it. We didn't have freedom. We were uh, literally working harder, building our network marketing business away from our home, always mm -hmm. on the phone, not seeing the residual income that we were promised, yes. which is why we got involved in the profession right. in the first place. When I say we, my wife and I met in the industry. Oh, no. um, oh. But yeah, it just, it just, it seemed like uh, we were either going to have to walk away yeah. or find a better way to do it. And we started having like some major, I don't know how many of your listeners can, can appreciate this or relate to this, but we started experiencing major MLM PTSD. And it was like, we need to figure out a better way to do this. Right. Thank God for Mark Zuckerberg and social media because uh, that that was a game changer for us for sure. Yeah, it's so funny that uh, you mentioned Zuck because one thing that you said during that really resonated with me. So often entrepreneurs like us feel like we're broken because we're so Absolutely. different from what the real world is. And, you know, and Mark, I mean, perfect example. I mean, talk about a broken dude. Like talk about breaking the system, being, you know, super high end Ivy League cat dropping out and creating the, you know, one of the greatest companies in the world. So man, right. It's like when, when you think about the fact that we've got this, you know, almost broken mentality, how do you address 
new entrepreneurs that feel like they're weirdos and don't know if they're going to be right for this industry or not. Well, and that's the thing. It's like, thank God for, you know, the Gary Vaynerchuks and all these guys that broke the mold, really speaking about this yeah. all the time to the general society, because, mm -hmm. You know, obviously network marketing, we're like, you know, screw schools, screw jobs. You know, we obviously have to be a little more diplomatic these days. But <laughs> at the end of the day, we all think the same way. Like, you want to pay me that small amount of money to build your company, build your dream? Hell no. Why would I ever do that? Yeah. And then, of course, you got the debate from the anti-MLM people. Uh you know, is network marketing really entrepreneurship? And I'm like, look, you can call it whatever you want, mm -hmm. but I love knowing that I don't have to answer to anybody. I love knowing that I can make, you know, as much money as I could in traditional business without all the risks, yeah. right? Without all the, 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 you know, headaches of traditional business. And mm -hmm. I still get the tax advantages. It's a willable, sellable asset. You just told me how you sold your business. Like yeah. who, who could ever sell their job? Right. And who would want to buy a job? That doesn't even make any sense. So people can call it whatever they want. And of course, again, the anti-MLM crowd. And by the way, you know, the anti-MLM crowd, the people that don't like MLM, I don't actually disagree with a lot of their bullet points. Mm -hmm. I think the network marketing industry is also broken. Not mm -hmm. all companies and not all, you know, people are doing it wrong. But, but for years and years and years, I do think we were doing it wrong. In fact, the last company I was in was a company called Vima. And Mel, you may know about this. I'm sure you do because you've been in the industry. Uh, they were shut down by the Federal Trade Commission for being a pyramid scheme. Now, personally, I didn't feel that they should have been shut down. I feel like there could have been maybe some warnings, some fines, some you know reprimanding, but they just shut them down. And I lost a six-figure income like that. Oh. But when you look back, when you look back, obviously, it was a blessing in disguise. One of the best things that could have happened to us was that company getting shut down. I hate mm -hmm. to admit, but it's true. We were way more successful now, yeah. but uh, there was too much emphasis on recruiting and mm -hmm. making money. Yeah. There was too much emphasis on, because there was a lot of young people. Yep. They had this thing, I don't know if you ever heard of this, YPR, Young Person Revolution. Mm. And they had all these like 18, 19, 20, 21, you know, really young top earners that yeah. are making, you know, some in some cases, not just five figures a month, six figures a month. Kids. And they're telling kids like, hey, look, you know, buy a builder pack for 500 bucks, drop out of school. Your professors are, are employees. Your parents aren't rich. Like, come join us, right? Yeah. And of course, that's a problem, right? I don't think you should ever tell people that they're going to get rich because most people won't get rich. Right. But the fact that it's possible is what intrigued me. The yeah. fact that I could do something to supplement my income, mm -hmm. to have a plan B just in case, like to have a choice, to have other income streams in case you lose your job, in case you lose your business. Yeah. Anyway, I'm going on a, a rant as I typically do. It just, it was, it was a necessary, unfortunate circumstance mm -hmm. that I think was a wake up call for our industry that we yeah. need to do better. Dude, I'm so happy that you mentioned the FTC ratio of builders to consumers because, yes. it, and, and that's one of the reasons why I love to interview uh, executives on the show. You know, I think I'm one of the only network marketing podcasts that actually brings executives on because I want people to hear what's going on in the real world. Like what's going on right. behind those golden doors. And it, it's so prevalent now because people don't realize the danger that they put their company into when they start going into that mode that, you know, builder, 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 builder. I don't care about customers anymore. And, you know, as we've talked about, that's one of the reasons why Conchetta and I love working with health and wellness professionals because it was like you get one doctor and they'd have a thousand patients to enroll. So it just right. always put us Amen. in the right side of the FTC which in yes. turn is company to do it. So, and, and let's say this too, yeah. Mel. If yeah, you don't have a product that an end consumer wants to purchase outside of the compensation plan, the opportunity, yes. that in itself is a problem. But let's just assume you do, then why wouldn't you want to teach customer acquisition? Like my team, and I don't want to go too far on this either because I know there's a lot we could cover, but just as an example, since mm -hmm. we started to shift our focus on social media from, you know, get rich, make money, mm -hmm. fire your boss, you know, yeah. Build residual income, which we still talk about those things sometimes, uh, again, a little more diplomatic because of FTCs yeah. and all these other right. entities. But at the end of the day, most people are not cut out for entrepreneurship, at least not at first. You know, if they fall in love with the product, they naturally start sharing it because they love it. That's different. But the fact of the matter is it's easier to get a customer. It's easier to teach customer acquisition. You mm -hmm. know, I like to compare it to uh, cars. Now, this is kind of a funny analogy, but it's a good point. Do you know more people that sell cars or drive cars? <laughs> Great point. Obviously, we all know more people that have bought a car than sell a car, 
We know yeah. more people driving cars than selling them. Yeah. But with that being said, we know more car salesmen than car dealership owners, mm -hmm. right? Right, right? So it's the same thing in insurance, in real estate. It should be the same thing in network marketing that you have way more customers than you do distributors. So, you know, our average on our team is 10 customers per active distributor and the average customer is spending about $100 per month which is insane. So what does that mean? You can build a team of 100 people and you'll have 100,000 in volume. Yeah. That's what excites me. Mm -hmm. Because if 100 people all have 10 customers each, right? Now you're talking some serious revenue right. from customers. In fact, I think we're at like 85% mm -hmm. customer to rep ratio. Yeah, and yeah. you got 1,000 customers paying 100 a month, mm -hmm. right? That's 100,000 in volume right. and you have a real business. And here's the best part. As a leader that has built teams, you can build a smaller team that produces essentially 10 times the revenue mm -hmm. that the typical MLM self-consumption yes. you know, company you see where it's just mm -hmm. like recruiting recruiters to recruit recruiters yeah. All right. and essentially build a smaller team that does more revenue. Yes, yeah. you make more money, but forget about that. You have more people in your team making money. So we should all want to teach our people how to get and retain customers. Mm -hmm. And brother, I'm going to take that one step further. The easiest person to convert into being a builder is a happy customer. Amen. Like the nobody, easiest. nobody Hands thinks down. about this. It drives me Hands crazy. Down. Like how how do you not follow up with your customers to right. offer the opportunity? How do you not check in with them to make sure they're happy? And hey, you know, now you're happy. Now you're feeling better. How'd you like to make a couple bucks a month? Like, dude, right. like, it blows me. Away you know that anybody make that, that would love to lose weight? Do you know anybody that would love to use <laughs> these products? Also, like at one. Thousand percent. Some of my best leaders started out as customers, yes. and you should never. It should never be. You know, here's the other problem in the profession. And look, I did this, and you probably did this at some point too. It was like, you know, pitch them the opportunity, and if they don't want to do the, the the business, I mean, I guess worst case scenario, <laughs> yeah. you can have some get stuff. them on the product, you can have some pills, get them as a. <laughs> <laughs> uh, dude, it's, it's heartbreaking. Isn't it heartbreaking that the default is to make somebody feel better or to be more healthy? Yeah. Like, right. how, how did that system come into play? <laughs> right. know, like, how, how broken is the model that yeah. that was you, the default? Yeah. yeah. You only want to use the, the, the product. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Crazy. It's crazy. So, dude, obviously from this interview, it's, you know, obvious to the crowd that you and I love being on camera. You know, when, when that little red button goes, you and I just light on fire. <laughs> So, so now I want to talk about how you're bringing new builders on that might not feel as comfortable with the camera. Because I mean, the, the camera is a massive part of the building strategy these days. So how are you helping your new folks who aren't as comfortable as you and I when that little red button gets hit? You know, I just, I tell them probably the same thing that, that any leader would tell someone in that situation is, first of all, you don't have to be on camera. You don't have to make a lot of money, <laughs> right? You don't <laughs> have to do anything, but uh, none of us were comfortable at first. Like I was terrified of public speaking. And I find that a lot of the people that are like most terrified of speaking are the ones that have a lot of the capability. Like some of them have the best potential to really impact people. It's funny how that goes, right? It's, it's, it's the ones that aren't afraid that you got to be worried about. They're like, give me the microphone or, you know, they're, they're trying to do videos all the time. And it's just brutal because they're almost like narcissistic, right? Like I think most people, most people are intimidated at first to do videos, but you have to ask yourself a question. What weighs more your ego or your bank account? Because it's really just pride. It's us not wanting to look bad. It's us not wanting to be embarrassed. As Brendan Burchard always says, you know, most of us are too embarrassed to start small. And the truth is when you suck at video, that's, that's great because the reality is when you first get started, nobody's going to watch your videos anyway because you suck and yep. you're brand new and you're going to get lots of like very few views. It's actually mm -hmm. a good thing. You know, you don't want to like wait until you have this massive business and then start showing up on camera and you're brutal, right? <laughs> then you start showing up on, on trainings and you haven't done it. And you got this huge team that looks up to you and they're like, oh my gosh, that was horrible. But mm -hmm. on the flip side, you know, it's interesting too, because I think it can almost, it can almost in a weird way backfire when you are really good on camera, when you are really good at speaking and hear me out on this, because sometimes people can't relate to that. They're like, mm -hmm. I can never do what you're doing. Yeah. So it, it, as much as it's good to highlight people that are doing videos and they're doing the reels and the TikToks and, you know, they're doing all the things. It, it's actually good if you have people that are not doing that and creating results and to also 
acknowledge those people because what I love about social media, you don't have to be on camera to be successful. You don't have to be. You don't have to do videos. There are plenty of people that maybe love writing or maybe they're really good at storytelling or uh, podcasts, right? Where it's just audio. Like there are other ways, yeah. but still, if you want to keep it real and and it's like, hey, what's the best way to use social media? It's mm-hmm. absolutely, whether it's YouTube video, Reels, TikToks, Facebook Lives are my favorite. Mm-hmm. You you should, if you said, John, what do I really need to master to generate leads and build a following and eventually build a business of significance online? It's mm-hmm. got to be you showing your face on camera because people do business with people they know, like, and trust people they can relate to. It's hard to really trust someone if you have no idea who they are and what they look like. Totally. But with that being said, hey, I got people on my team that they'll never do a video, but they'll do selfies all day. Mm. They'll do they'll do things that are more creative with graphics and yeah. using images and sharing testimonials before and afters. Mm-hmm. So I'm not going to sit here and say you have to do it, but it's definitely one of the fastest ways mm-hmm. to build that no like trust and get attention for sure. Beautiful. So now let's flip the coin and let's mm-hmm. talk about retention because, mm-hmm. you know, massive growth for a lot of folks means their retention goes through the toilet. They just, right. they're, they're, they're enrolling them as fast as they're losing them. And, and it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking. Yeah. They, you know, put the time and effort into getting, you know, finally becoming an enrollment machine and then not having the re- retention factor in place. You know, I know you, you guys are really high enrollers. So what are you doing? And again, we're talking about today. We're not talking about 10 years ago. What are you guys doing today to keep this massive flood of enrollments, happy, smiling and, and coming back to the till? It's such a good point, man. I say that all- all the time. I'm like, why work so hard to generate leads and build a following and build relationships? And then you sign someone up and you're like, all right, see you later. <laughs> like horrible. So for us, we use project broadcast or shout like, and I say, or because some people use one or the other. Um, I, I don't tell people what to do necessarily. We just give them recommendations. Kind of like right now I'm saying, Hey, you can do reels, TikTok, whatever. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but project broadcast and shout are two really great apps for basically text messaging your customers letting them know about specials, letting them know about a challenge in the group, you know, sharing whatever you want to share that's going to provide value, yeah. tips, you know, using the products, whatever, following up with them without having to individually message people. Mm-hmm. I love Project Broadcast. It's it's the one I use the most. Yeah. And I love the fact that my VA can actually send out the text oh. messages, you know, deal with all the responses. And you know what? We tell people, listen, if you don't want to receive these messages, just, you know, say, you know, respond with the word stop, yeah. you know, and, and look, we also have ATM groups, right? I'm sure mm-hmm. your audience has heard, is a, heard of the ATM groups. We were the company, we were the team that really started using that strategy, that created that strategy mm-hmm. in the very early days. Uh, but ATM stands for ad tag message. So we add our prospects when they express interest in the business community. And then we also have a product community mm-hmm. inside of that community. We'll do challenges, we'll do uh, interviews, we'll share special promos, we'll do recognition, you know, those types of things. So you've got the Facebook community to communicate. You could do uh, uh, project broadcast or shout to text message people Mm -hmm. and stay in touch. It's just so important that you're finding creative ways to, you know, stay in touch, to reach Mm -hmm. out, to nurture those relationships. I mean, I'm the biggest, like, I get, and I'm sure you've had this happen. I'll get people that are like, Hey, you know, I'm busy right now. I I still want to build this business. So let's talk about distributors for a second. They're like, but you know, don't quit on me. Don't give up on me. Like I'm just, I'm just, you know, I got some things going on and I tell them all the same thing. And I say this to everybody, I never give up on anybody. I never burn a bridge unless it's like a really terrible human. That's Mm -hmm. different. I'll block their ass. But you know, I always say I'll invite them to my VIP block party. Uh, (laughs) But you know, if they're a good person, like I'll always stay in touch. Mm -hmm. I'll always follow up. If I see their post or, you know, I see them, you know, somehow showing up somewhere on my phone, like I'll drop a, I'll drop a comment, drop a message, like staying in touch with people. Like what is the point of signing up so many people? If you're not going to support them, if you're not going to help them with the products, help them with the business, you know, it's like, uh, I'm not even excited when I sign up a customer. I'm excited when they're loving the products. Yes. I'm not excited when I sign up a distributor. I'm excited when they rank advance, when they first start getting customers, when they yes. first sign up their first recruit and mm-hmm. they start to build up their confidence. And with that being said, the one last tip, dude, we have been crushing this strategy for years now. And that's doing referral posts. 
Mm. Having our customers. Now, I can't say that all companies have this, but I think a lot of companies now have a referral program of some Mm. sort (laughs) where a customer, they're not getting paid, but they can post about the products, Mm -hmm. share their discount code. And when they do that and someone purchases, they get a shopping credit for themselves that they can use towards their own personal order. The give get, right? The give get model. So, uh, and we've seen obviously a lot of companies do this now, right? We'll give you 20 bucks if you you refer a customer, $10 Mm -hmm. you refer a customer. We have a program like that we've had for for six and a half, seven years now. And uh, it's been super powerful because, you know, there's some people that they don't want to do network marketing. Mm-hmm. Right. But they love the product and yeah. they would like to share it with people and mm-hmm. hook them up with a discount code. So we literally give them a picture if they don't have their own that they want to use. And we give them the copy that they can put on the post. Yes. And they just put that on their Facebook or Instagram. And then we as the distributor are we're called social marketers in our company. Mm-hmm. Right. But whatever you're called, right. Ambassadors, yeah. distributors, IBOs, whatever. Mm-hmm. Like you're the one getting paid, not your yeah. customer. Right. So you should be the one working all the responses and all the leads. Yeah. And that's been amazing. One third. Think about this. 33% of our customers are referred by an existing customer. That is insane. Dude, that is amazing. absolutely insane. But that's because we are really big on doing referral posts. Yeah. I have people on my team, they do one to two referral posts a day. So imagine having 30 plus posts a day from people that are not on your team, just your personal customers that yeah. are posting. And, and look, sometimes they're going to post and it gets crickets. But yeah. there's sometimes we'll have someone post kind of like what you said before about like the person loves the product. So they're really easy to get yeah, up yeah, to yeah. upgrade to become a distributor. There well, guess go. what? If someone does a referral post, and they get 19 comments. You're like, listen, you're like, listen, Sarah, I know you don't want to do the business, but you got 19 people that are requesting information. Yeah. Now, let's just say 10 of them order. Well, 10 times 10, if you got 10 shopping credits per customer, that's a hundred bucks in shopping credits. That's pretty cool. Uh, but you could actually earn commissions. Now I have no problem earning those commissions, but I'm just giving you a heads up. You're basically doing the business at this point because you got all these people that want to order. So if you were a distributor, you'd be getting paid and you'd be getting credits. Yeah. It's up to you. So it's a really cool way to kind of like backdoor a person into joining because they don't understand like that's basically doing the business. Like think of it this way. If I sign someone up as a distributor and they never post on their page, Mm -hmm. right? They never post about the products. They're a secret agent. They're going (laughs) to, they're probably not going to make much money. Right, but right. on the flip side, if I get a customer that posts on their page and they get a ton of people responding, like that's kind of crazy. They're actually doing the business without right. even realizing it because that's all you need to do when you're getting started. Now, of course, at some point, there would be more involvement if they actually wanted to build a significant business. Mm-hmm. But how cool is it that we've got people posting about our products that are not getting compensated? They just love the products. And they want shopping credits. It's a very organic way to build. It's so funny, Mix. I was just talking to, to Tony and Sarah Zalecki about that the other day. And the, the reason I'm mentioning that is because we talked about the fact that the hardest referral in the world is when somebody knows you're making money off it. So like the easiest, like right. when you're making money off of referring something, you're not really referring it anymore. Right. <laughs> yeah. so, so it's like for them to get that first sale, that, that first move into the industry, it's like the easiest one they'll ever have. Yeah. So it's so like, wow. Great system, man. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like, it's so cool. Yeah. So now tell me, obviously, I mean, you're, you've got a massive international audience because we're, we're talking on the internet, but do you see that you have to speak to certain countries differently, certain cultures? Like, do you do like a live for an Asian market differently than you would do for a Middle Eastern market? Or are you just johnning them out? And, and if they love me, they love me. If they don't, move on to the next slide. It's a good question. I mean, I, I'd say this though. I, I've got people all over the world that follow our stuff and mm-hmm. tune into our podcasts, our Facebooks, our posts. So, you know, I do a lot of Facebook lives, like I said, but then we also have YouTube podcast blog. Uh, we'll get people on from South America, South Africa. We'll get people on from Brazil, Brazil's mm-hmm. in South America, uh, you know, different parts of, 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 you know, Australia, all over Europe. And, and here's the thing. There's people that love us and dislike us in every country. There's people in the U S there's people up the road from my house. I live in Maryland. <laughs> right. There's people up the road. They see my stuff like, Oh my gosh, that guy's so much too much. It's annoying. Right. Oh, his wife and her annoying Russian accent. They're too happy. I mean, you're going to get that stuff anywhere and everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I love when people are like, oh, you know, in the UK, people don't like spending money. They're cheap. Or, you know, in my part of Kentucky, uh, people don't don't like uh, uh, influencers or whatever. Right. They don't like <laughs> social media, social market. Like you're going to get people 
all over the world that like and dislike you. In fact, if you don't have anybody hating on you, you're probably not doing a whole lot. Amen, brother. So I just show up as me. I'm not going to try to put on a front or be something I'm not. Mm -hmm. With that being said, you do have to know your audience, right? So if I'm doing like a team Zoom or uh, I'm doing a training for you know, someone that that's, you know, within my organization and they have a little bit of a, maybe an older crowd, an older demographic, yeah. I'm going to mention things that would appeal to them versus mm-hmm. if I have a younger person on my team or a Canadian, I'm going to say things differently or mention things that are, that are different yeah. about, you know, the Canadian market, the nuances that are up there versus, you know, my Australian team or my India team, you know, mm-hmm. so really great points that you do want to obviously customize your conversation depending on the audience, depending on who you're communicating with. But at the same time, like I don't change who I am and how I show up. Yeah. Gotcha. So I I know you guys are really good about using coupon codes. I mean, you guys are really good about technology. Yeah. Is is that kind of where everything, and again, let's, let's just talk broad market right now for a second. Do you think that the, the coupon code, the app world, the everything else is moving to the point where, you know, sort of the older school belly to belly person is going to just suffer and just not be able to grow at the right pace right now. The, the technophobic kind of person. I think it's an interesting conversation because I will say this. Now, this is just, just this is a very new epiphany I've had over the last six months. As much as I love building online mm-hmm. with the pandemic and all that, like our business flourished, but there is a degree of, there, there's a lack of professionalism and uh, the, the leadership development, the growth that is of the utmost importance mm-hmm. that happens and occurs offline. Yeah. So, you know, the, like you, you can't, you, you, you can't replace that in-person energy in the relationships and the experience of being with people in person. So uh, even throughout the pandemic, we still would have, you know, a couple times a year, we do like team retreats and, and different things. And obviously it was tough to navigate that through pandemic and travel yeah. and s- some places are stricter than others. We bought a couple of beach houses down in Destin, Florida that we use as vacation rentals. And uh, those have been amazing. Like the, some of the best people we have on our team at one point, were almost thinking about quitting, hmm. but they came to an event. They, they got together with like 15 other yeah. amazing leaders on the team. And, you know, I, I still love the concept of hybrid marketing. Now, what I mean by that, and it wouldn't even be hybrid marketing. It would really just be hybrid building. So hmm. I still love the online. I'm probably the biggest advocate. I probably started doing attraction marketing before anybody in network marketing. Literally, I started learning attraction marketing from Mike Dillard, uh, Shalene Johnson, Gary Vaynerchuk, building a brand, Ray Higdon. But most of them were doing blogs. They were doing the blogs. They were doing, they were blogging. They were doing yeah. YouTube. There was very few people that were using social media. Like we were the ones. And, and I'll give you another example. I joined Vima back in 2013. A lot of those young people were using social media, but they were not branding themselves in the way that I was. They were like very like, they were very much like, I am with Vima, you should join. Now they were doing videos, but it wasn't really a- attraction marketing or curiosity marketing. It was very like in your face marketing, yeah. right? Guerrilla marketing, whatever you want to call that. So I-, I still believe that you need to have an element of offline, even if it's just for like, special leadership events, retreats, yeah. uh, you know, your big annual conference, mm-hmm. you know, your escape trips or whatever you call your, your, uh, you know, top earner trips. Like yeah. you still need that stuff. 1000%. Mm-hmm. It is still paramount. Maybe not like it once was, we don't have like weekly offline meetings, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? We're not, but I, I still, Tony and I were just talking about this this summer. We're going to fly into a market and do a big, like Friday night leadership, and then Saturday training, just to have something in the dog days of the summer, you know, mm-hmm. late July, early August, you know, things are slower, because yeah. that's the time, as you know, there are seasons of growth. Mm-hmm. And there's seasons of slowdown where it's like, okay, you know, sometimes we have to maybe uh, during the slower times, you know, refocus or double down on a certain, you know, activity that maybe we don't need to do, we don't need to do as much like referral posts, you know, talking about referral posts yeah. for one second. Back to that. Uh, there's times where, like, when TikTok was blowing up, mm-hmm. like blowing up, like yeah. someone could do a TikTok, like a live TikTok, like they would go live on TikTok, 
they do 12,000 in sales in like an hour. That's not going to happen now, right? Unless someone already has a following. Right. Like I literally, I had a woman on my team, Jordan Lebeck. She went from 700 followers to 1.1 million followers on TikTok in 10 months, right? Like if someone downloads TikTok right now, they're not going to be able to do that in, in right. 10 months yeah. because it's just, it's more mature, right? Mm-hmm. So there's, there's those seasons of growth and seasons of slowdown where you're like, okay, let's, let's maybe, uh, you know, do like a big leadership, you know, weekend and get everybody together and, and do some relationship building and, yeah. uh, you know, get people refocused, you know, during the slower times. So, so I really think people need to, to start thinking in terms of, you know, five years out and kind of having a plan, like, mm-hmm. and that was one thing that our company did a few years ago that was really helpful where it's like, okay, first quarter of every year, you know, you're going to have your annual conference, yeah. Right. First week or two in November, you know, you're going to have your escape trip. You right, know, in June, right. we're going to have a leadership conference. You know, so you can almost like plan out your next five years mm-hmm. having an agenda and going, okay, here's the busy, like November for us is insane to the membrane. Insane. Every single year, last six and a half years, because mm-hmm. of Black November deals, oh. uh, we've had our biggest month of the year in November. Oh. Every single year, November is our biggest month of the whole year. So you know that to be true. So it's kind of cool to have our escape trip in the beginning of November. Yeah. Everybody gets to chill. Everybody gets to hang out. We have a good time. We build some, some relationships, make some memories and we come back and we go balls to the wall. Then guess what? You already know it's going to slow down under the holidays or it's going to maybe be a little slow at the beginning of the year trying to revamp. So, you know, when you have that clarity and you have like a five-year plan, it's so damn helpful. And again, you're treating your business like a business and not a hobby. And you're having that CEO mentality mm-hmm. where it's not just like, just like winging it and just kind of haphazardly going day to day, week to week, month to month. And, you know, I think that's, that's common when oh, you're yeah. new <laughs> and you're yeah. part-time, yeah. but I got to tell you, man, those early years, and I'm, you, you've been in the profession a while too, Mel, like back in the day, I, I don't know if I would have made it without the offline, without the, like the in-person stuff, those weekend events, you go to the weekend event, you come back and you're like, just on fire, at least for like 90 days. Yeah. Right. Until you cool off and you're like, Oh, I'm exhausted. And there's another (laughs) big event. It's like, you know, promote from event to event. So anyway, sorry to be so long winded on that. No, 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 no. no. As much as I love the online. Yeah. Big advocate. I do think some people are a little zoomed out. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Cheers. Yeah. And dude, good choice in Destin. Uh, so I don't know if you know, this, we, live in, we live in Sarasota, Florida, which oh, is there you go. I love same, Sarasota water, too. same beaches, same dude, everything. So that was the other place we looked at. Uh, Sarasota was the, uh, we love Sarasota. Here's the only difference though. Our upline has like five, six properties in Destin. Oh, so gotcha. they like knew the area and knew about rentals. Like I yeah. didn't have that type of contact or connection or a trusted you know, person in Sarasota that right. owned a bunch of rental properties, but dude, I love Sarasota. Oh man, it's 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 so funny. This is like a little micro network marketing epicenter. <laughs> you cannot believe how many cool people live between here and Siesta Key. It's just awesome. So, hey man, how long have you been ask, down there? Out of curiosity, uh, we've been here for thirteen years. Wow. Okay. So, yeah. Like, so you've seen you've seen it blow up. Oh yeah, we you know so we're way past the honeymoon period. The whole deal. <laughs> I tell you what, brother, you could pay me a million dollars right now, and I ain't leaving. We yeah. just, we love this place because we grew up in the Northeast. You know, it's yeah. like when, when you're a Northeasterner and you're dealing with gray skies six months a year, snow, rain, mud season. It's like, and it's funny because we were up there um, probably a couple of years ago and we did a little build trip up there for six months. And you talk to people and, and I was, we were in Connecticut. You talk to people and they, and they just complain. And it's like, you know what? There's 49 other states. <laughs> I do right. not see a chain around your ankle. I don't want to hear how cloudy it is because there's plenty of right. other places where you don't see, cl- you know, if you live in Phoenix, you'd pay money to see a cloud. You know what I mean? Right. Well, here's the crazy thing though, not to go off topic, but in Destin, the only thing I don't love mm-hmm. is it gets cold. They yes. get the, they get yeah, all right? the seasons and some people might like that, but like, I don't like going there in January wearing a yeah. scarf in a hood, like it's way too cold. So people are like, are you going to move to Destin? And I always, I always say the same thing. If it miraculously warms up to be like mm-hmm. Naples or Sarasota climate, Tampa, right. you know, Orlando, yeah. sure. But that's not going to happen. So uh, probably not. We'll probably yeah. just have it the way it is right now with those rentals. Mm-hmm. Uh, there are some homes down there that I see and I'm like, oh my gosh, I would love to buy that. It's just with my kids are five years from now, my 
my son will be done college and my daughter mm-hmm. will be done high school. Maybe oh, that'll perfect. be when we, we make the move. But um, anyway, not to get too far off topic, but if I was going to move yeah. in like six months, at least out of the year, live somewhere, because obviously that's the time to be there, right? When it's yeah, cold here, totally. yeah. when it's cold in Maryland, be in Florida, there it would go. be Sarasota, Naples, Tampa. Yeah. It would be somewhere on that West coast of Florida. I love it. And obviously you guys got the year round warmth. Yeah, it's it's Floridians joke that Tampa is our Mason Dixon line. Yeah, that's it. If you live north of May, if you live north of Tampa, you might see a flake of snow. Yes, there's the yeah. possibility in your life that you may see a flake of snow. If yeah. you live south, and we're about an hour south of Tampa, if you're south yeah. of Tampa, you can't buy snow. You know, it's, it's right. just it's you're just, good, uh, you're safe. You know what's crazy though? I was looking at Orlando because I like literally look at all the different cities and look at the temperatures, especially in the winter, because I'm curious and I like to just, you know, for whatever reason, I like to torture myself. And I'm like, oh, it's <laughs> it's 13 degrees here, but in Orlando or in Sarasota, it's like you know 71. I'm like, oh, yeah. but even yeah, even or Orlando, like in my mind, Orlando's like north, right? Tampa's north, but it's not. It's still they still have that full blown year round oh, yeah. summer weather. So anyway, sorry to get off topic, but yeah, I love it down there. Oh no, not at all, man. I'm, I'm, we got to get you guys to Sarasota. Dude. You're going to love it. We're, we, I, I already have a boating trip in mind. <laughs> <laughs> we are getting you and the kids out on the boat. You, as soon as you, as soon as you see Sarasota from Sarasota Bay on a boat, you're not going to want to live any place else in the world. It is just, yeah. nah. no, hey, it's perfect down there. I, I want to ask you what, um, what do you think it is going to be that next technological trend? I mean, being that you're so based in this, you're, you're so up, up on the apps, the site, like what, what do you think is going to be the spicy new thing? It's really tough to say, man, because, you know, reels has already started to cool off a little yeah. bit. Bingo. Uh, short form video is still really hot, but it's not like it was just six months ago. Uh, it'll be interesting to see. Mm-hmm. I'm really interested to see where things go because it's harder and harder to build a following. Yeah. Like not to say you can't like, gain new followers and stuff, but not the explosion that we are or were accustomed to. Yeah. So it'll be interesting. You know, we're always we're always paying attention to what's working. We're very connected as you are as well on, mm-hmm. uh, you know, w- with some of the best people on what they're doing and how they're doing it, and where yeah. they're getting their leads and where they're seeing success and, you know, what's easiest for, for uh, you know, duplication purposes, because it's not what works yeah. as we know in network marketing. Yeah. It's what duplicates. duplicates. <laughs> yep. And uh, I think ultimately there's still so much potential, but yeah. there's also uh, a negative connotation these days with with smartphones, with technology, with, mm-hmm. you know, there's just so much going on and all the political crap and all the negativity that's on social media and, and yeah. censorship. And there's some there's some craziness going on. So who knows where mm-hmm. it's going to be in five years. But uh, I still think like if we're talking right now, which we have been, is uh, short form videos are still the hottest the hottest strategy in the most simple way to get in front of an audience of people that don't know you, you know, like I have a woman right now, she's at about 85, maybe 90,000 in sales for the month, right? 85,000, 90,000 in personal sales, not Mm -hmm. team personal. And it's from TikTok. Like she had one video that had like 4 million views organically, like not paid traffic, not running ads, like four, three. I don't know how someone could do that any other way. Like, I don't know any other way someone could sell that much product for free on social media to complete selling a product to complete strangers. Now people would say, well, she lost a lot of weight or she's really good on camera or she's got more time. Okay. Right. You can, you can justify and make all the excuses why she can do something you can't do, but she's still doing it. And six months ago, she wasn't doing it. Six months Mm -hmm. ago, she wasn't crushing it like this. So the point is, someone that doesn't have years and years and years of experience and doesn't have money. And the fact that they can, you know, post videos on a platform from their phone, they can record something, (laughs) post it. And then like within a matter of days, weeks, months, be literally making a fortune for free. I just can't explain that. It's incredible. But I do think we'll see some, some major changes slash enhancements with AI. I don't know where that's going yeah. or if it's going to be good or bad for us. Yeah. Uh, but I do think there's going to be some major changes in the next three to five years with, with, with AI for sure. See, I keep thinking the same thing. Augmented reality keeps coming back and coming back and coming back and coming back. And I really think that's going to be the thing, but man, you made the perfect something point. Something with like, the metaverse, something with all that. Yeah. There's going to be something yeah. wacky. because well, It'll I mean, be a factor. 
you, you made that great point that like, you know, the, the girl, I can't remember her name that was on your team when TikTok kind of first started and she went from zero to a million and like overnight. So, I mean, honestly, we just need that next new TikTok, which is going to happen. Some, some smart yeah. kid's going to think of the next thing and TikTok's going to be for old people. Like, you know, it's like all this, you know, Facebook was cool. Now it's for old people. <laughs> TikTok <laughs> it's, will be for old people. Yeah. yeah. That's good point. That's See, now that point. I'd watch. <laughs> if we can get a bunch of old people. Well, you, you know, it's interesting though, too. You know, it's interesting. It's a good point you made. Uh, I pay attention to my kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know where they spend a lot of time? You know where they spend a lot of time? Do you know? No. Where? Snapchat. See, I, how does Snapchat still hot? That thing's been around for years, dude. That's how they all communicate. That's how, that's how they all, I, and I can't tell you the exact reason why, mm -hmm. but it, it, it still has their <laughs> attention. And the reason I say that and mention that because you might say, oh, well, yeah, but they're teenagers. Yeah, but they're not going to be teenagers in five, 10 years. Right. They're going to be in their 20s. Yeah. And if they're still using it, I just, you know, it, it's just funny how like even like Twitter, you there's still potential with Twitter, the oldest social yep. platform, exactly. right? There's obviously still huge potential yep. with Facebook, right? Mm -hmm. That's, I think you and I connected on Facebook. Yeah, exactly. But totally. it, it's it's interesting because there is always either either there's like a, you know, a new platform or there's just like a new thing on an existing platform, yes. kind of like how Snapchat was, was, you know, stories. Mm -hmm. And then Instagram's like, or Mark Zuckerberg, actually back to Mark. He's like, I can't buy Snapchat. Yeah. So I'm just going to create stories on Instagram. And then eventually that came to Facebook. And mm -hmm. that's been obviously a super powerful strategy. Yeah. In fact, I would probably say that I've generated more leads from my existing following using stories than I have anything else from my existing following. Yeah. Huh. Excellent. Thanks for telling us that. Hey, uh, do me a favor. It's, I mean, some folks will be listening to this in their car on their phone. They can't, you know, they can't see like me, so they won't be able to read the show notes. Uh, how can people uh, contact you personally? What's the best contact? Uh, Facebook or Instagram, real easy ways to get in touch with us. Just, you know, John Melton on Facebook or Instagram. And then we do have our blog, our website, my lifestyle Mm -hmm. uh, where people can access our blog, our free resources, our social media prospecting guide with scripts, mm -hmm. uh, podcasts, all the things. And they can even join our Facebook community. We have over like, I think we have over 35,000 network marketers from various companies in our, our My Lifestyle Academy group. Uh -huh. um, so they can join that group for free on our website. So you're helping the whole industry with that group. You're not just building. Yeah, we started that group. Actually, you know, it's crazy. We started that group back in like 2013. And yeah, and we, we were really focused on it in the early years. Yeah. Uh, but it's still, I mean, there's still new members join every day. Huh. So it's, it's, it's kind of cool. I was just thinking about this the other day. It's probably almost a 10 year old group. Wow. You know, maybe it was started in 2014, but still mm -hmm. it's coming up on 10 years since uh, we started that, that community. It's pretty cool. So that's craziness. So, Hey, uh, I want to know what your six month goal is aside from getting to, get down to Sarasota and go boating with me. Uh, what is your six month goal? Uh, you know, I really want to get to 10 million a month in sales. I really want to hit that 10 million per month. Just 10 million one time would be cool. I think our biggest month we did 9.3, 9.2. Oh, so um, oh, must have killed yeah. you to be that close. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, it was crazy. Uh, but yeah, 10 million a month is, is yeah. my goal. It was my goal last year. It's my mm -hmm. goal again this year. And then also I want to get to seven figures in uh, passive income from our investments and mm -hmm. all the different things we do, because I just think that's a cool thing to say that, you know, we're making some figures from just our investments and, yeah. you know, using our money to make us more money. As Mr. Wonderful says, when your soldiers go out into the world, you want them to come back with more soldiers. So yeah. oh, like that, great. I'm all about that. I mean, I think the, the biggest thing for all of us, whether you're in network marketing or not, mm -hmm. uh, so most of your, your guests are going to be, but it's take your active income and invest it so that you can create passive income that eventually surpasses your active income. Yeah. Thank you for saying that because nothing drives me more crazy than somebody who takes their commission check, buys a Porsche, and then can't put gas in it. Nadia won't even let me buy a nice car. Like, <laughs> and and, and I, I, should, I shouldn't say that because we basically, we own uh, two Teslas, right? We have an X and an S and we love them. Um, <laughs> and, then, and then I also have my Maserati on lease but the lease is expiring. And I'm like, let me buy this. Let me buy that. She's like, baby, I cannot justify buying a third vehicle. It's a liability. It just it doesn't make no sense. I'm like, but it's badass. And she's like, no, no, we will buy other piece of property. We will buy Her accent is not that thick. She's sitting right over there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> funny, but, you know, it, but sometimes when she's mad, it is that thick, baby. Right. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Indeed. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy, man, because you think, you think when you make a bunch of money 
that that's what you're supposed to do. Go buy the Breitling watch, go buy the Gucci. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with buying that stuff if you're making that much money. Yeah. But when it's like the whole commission check, yes. <laughs> you know, and then the problem is the problem is uh, within a few months, you realize as nice as that Porsche is, you're already like used to it and it's yep. not as exciting, but there you still go. got to pay the payment. And then on top of that, if your business declines, Whew. there's nothing worse than setting yourself up for failure. And now you're stressed mm -hmm. because now you need to make enough money to keep up with the car payment. Right. And I remember when by Salas, when they collapsed and there was like thousands of people with repossessed cars, like nothing kills momentum more than having your leaders have their cars repossessed. So yeah. Don't be a dummy and let these really smart people get your dumb money. Because I learned this from Danny Johnson. I'll never forget it. She said, there are people that spend all day figuring out, really smart people, really smart. They spend all day long trying to figure out how to get your dumb money from you. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That, that, that's an awesome soundbite. Thank you. <laughs> that's fantastic. So, hey, John Melton, thanks so much for being on today, brother. This was just so much fun. Really enjoyed it myself. I, I, I hope everybody else enjoyed it, but I certainly had a good time and I hope you did too, bud. Yeah, man, I'll have to have you on my show to interview you as well. I know you got a crazy, awesome, amazing story and uh, appreciate you guys elevating the profession and uh, doing all the things you do. And I can't wait to get my hands on that book. Yeah, thank you, brother. Seven Figure Network will be out soon. Go, editor. Hurry up, buddy. <laughs> Thanks, brother. I appreciate it. We'll talk soon. Thanks, man. See ya. See ya. Hey there. I hope you really enjoyed the show. And now I have a question to ask. Do you want to know how to build a seven-figure network with just three to five enrollments a month? That's just three to five conversations, not 30 to 50. That means we only have to convince three to five people to say yes to build a real seven-figure network. Scan the code or click the link at the bottom of this page now to discover the step-by-step -step method for exactly how you can add hundreds, if not thousands of customers to your downline by recruiting and enrolling businesses and health professionals onto your team that have hundreds of built-in customers that need your product or opportunity. Get the Seven Figure Network book now and let's start building massive volume with an enormous downline of businesses, health professionals, and customers.